So today I will talk about the work we are doing recently using uh, actually a combination of uh, PRAG, which is Blue Waters, and uh, Exit. We are using Stampid. We have been using Stampid for a while, and now we are transitioning into uh, Blue Waters. So uh, I will not distinguish which model is run on which machine, but we are running more and more models on um, Blue Waters. And there are two parts, two projects I would quickly go through. First one is to uh, investigate the dynamics of flat slab subduction in South America. And uh, just to give you some brief idea about what is flat slab subduction for those who are not familiar with this concept. So in this particular geometry, I'm mean, showing the Central America uh, flat slab subduction geometry. So 30 million years ago, the subduction is pretty normal. As you can see, the, the, the downgoing slab or the oceanic plate is pretty steep. So it's subducting beneath the continent. And uh, as Wait a minute. Yeah, as time goes, and this is just a conceptual model, the slab, the deep, the deep angle becomes, I mean, reduces, uh, eventually becomes almost like zero degrees. So that's what people traditionally call flat slab. And uh, why we study this problem? Because flat slab subduction is presumably one of the most prominent uh, or efficient ways of shaping the Earth's surface geology. For example, it will cause the volcanic arc, like these are the volcanic arc. You can see that as the slab flattens, the arc migrate inland and uh, change word. Uh, and uh, uh, like, for example, Pacific Northwest, including this particular place, right? Newbury uh, is one of the end of the hotspot track, and I will show in, in the next part of the, of the talk. So another effect is a very strong lateral deformation of the upper plate or continent. For example, the formation of the Rocky Mountains, right? So it's actually not far from here. It's all potentially related to the flat slab subduction that happened in the past. And lastly, the vertical motion of continents or the upper plate. And this is actually critically, critically important because vertical motion, including both substance where you form big basins and sediments and eventually oil and gas deposits, you know, it's very economically important. And the river migration, you know, because the surface changes, the river will migrate, and that changes the erosion pattern, deposition pattern, and the, and the paleoenvironment as well. So um, for flat slab subduction, what caused this formation? And there are different theories. Uh, these are all conceptual models, as you can see, that the first hypothesis such that when the subducting plate carries a piece of over thickened oceanic crust, and the crust, because the crust is made of a different composition than the mantle itself, so it's actually buoyant. And the, during that subduction, it may, it may temporarily force the slab to flatten, so to go from here to here. On the other hand, if the overriding plate or the continent is moving very fast toward the trench, it's a fast trench retreat, whatever, it's just that process. And then the slab doesn't have enough time to sink, and eventually it will form a flat geometry as well. The third hypothesis is that a hydrodynamic suction, this has happened within the returning flow in the, in the corners. It's called the corner flow model. You probably know that. When the corner flow is really efficient, it will generate suction force. That will cause the slab to flatten. And these are all conceptual models, as you see that. And, the, and also, these are actually 2D models, right? So 2D models are easy. However, they are too generalized. And therefore, that's why for a given flat slab, for example, in South America, which is the best known flat slab that is still happening right now, people really don't know which is the dominant mechanism or which is the true mechanism. So to move forward, what we are doing here is we are moving from 2D to 3D and plus time dependent. So these are actually 4D geodynamic models. And uh, more importantly, this is a data simulation model. I mean, this, this kind of model differs from the generic model where you start with a kind of like a I don't know, arbitrarily sometimes defined initial conditions, just let the model run to the present day. What we do instead is we actually, when we run the model from an initial condition, we at the same time, we are assimilating a lot of data into the model. So in a way, this is similar to weather prediction. Okay, so in order to make the model physically meaningful, we are assimilating a lot of data, a lot of observational constraints so that the model cannot go too off from the true uh, physics. And eventually, this kind of model can be very useful because it can be predictive. So in this particular case, we are uh, including in the model the plate motion history, like each of these plates, as you can see, that is moving in different direction at different speeds. And also, the seafloor age varies with space and with time as well. And uh, like the, for South America, the Andes Plateau is the second largest organic plateau in the world. And this formation process also ch changes the geometry of the trench, because it's an overall shortening process. And the oceanic plateau subduction are these topographic high features. And this is what I just mentioned. And the tectonic cratons, like this uh, white feature, is what these are over thickened uh, 
uh, continental blocks, they would generate stronger hydrodynamic structuring force, right? So these are all competing hypotheses for the formation of the observed flat slab, and the flat slabs are actually kind of like shown here. I will get back to that. And just to show, give you a sense about the kind of data that goes into this model, so this is a reconstruction, a model, or a current understanding of the plane motion history. So from 140 million years ago all the way to present day, you see everywhere on the Earth's surface is moving. There's no fixed spot, right? So, so the continent of North America, South America, so the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, the subduction of the so-called Farallon Plate, and now it actually becomes, in the South America, the Nazca Plate, the Northern Project called the Juan de Fuca Plate. Now the Pacific Plate really grows, right? At the beginning, it was very small. So, so everything's changing, and these are all, all observations, and this is, this is the kind of constraint that goes into the model, therefore we don't have to worry about uh, that many variables. But still we need to worry about a, a pretty big number of, of variables. So, okay, with this kind of model, with this input, we ultimately we still need to validate the model using uh, observations such as seismic tomography. I don't know how many of you heard about this term. It's basically like a, like a medical tomography you see through human bodies. This is like earthquake waves can can let you see through the Earth's interior. So you see the geometry, the 3D geometry of the Earth today, right? And that's the present day geometry. And also, we have the distribution of earthquakes within the Earth and the, and the volcano on the Earth's surface. That those all uh, tell you something about uh, the present day configuration. And that is actually what we use to validate the model. And ultimately, we are trying to understand the mechanisms or the dynamics of flat slab subduction as well as the tectonic implications. Um, so, a little bit about the technical details. So, the model setup is a 4D convection model with data simulation. And we use the community code as uh, a fine element code called SICOM S. And, uh, um, and uh, because this is a data simulation model, there are so many things that goes into the model. It's sim trying to simulate the real Earth, right? But of course, with simplifications. But still, there are, there are a large, large number of parameters that we need to test. And that's why this requires a lot of com computation. And, uh, and potentially, because this model is kind of like interactive, at every time step, we're reading the observation, just like weather prediction models. And that's why this uh, IO is a potential problem. And uh, under that, we actually are working with a uh, uh, paid um, IME uh, team to work on that. Um, so particularly, this kind of model can range from like, the number of grade points anywhere from 10 million to like a, um, 0.1 million. It can be even larger. So we are on the frugal side still. So the number of unknowns is on the order of um, from 0.1 million to 1 billion. Um, it's pretty large, actually, for fine element models. So for the models I showed you, um, it uh, can consume up to uh, 100 million um, core hours. I mean, it's not node hours, but still, if you divide by 32, it's still like several uh, million core, uh, node hours. And we generate a lot of data. Um, so I will jump to one of the models, uh, one of the best fit models we, uh, we run. So this is a 3D representation of what happened uh, inside the mantle. This is starting from 100 million years ago. Um, just a little bit background. The flash lab subduction, as I said, is actually ongoing. It's today. And in order to avoid the unknown initial condition, which is always a problem for time dependent models, we actually start the model from 100 million years ago. And therefore, we don't worry about the initial condition, because we're only concerned about the past 10 million year evolution. OK, so what you're seeing here, you are looking westward. You are looking at the ISO surface of the temperature field. And this is a little bit of slab subducting into the mantle. And the color here represents corresponding to depth. This, this depth, again, is normalized uh, Earth's radius. So 0.6 is like 2,000 kilometer from the surface. Uh, red is from the surface, OK. So let's continue this movie. Now you see uh, slab subducting into the mantle, and the trench is retreating because South America is moving westward because the Atlantic Ocean is opening. And today, you see that's the predicted present day geometry uh, in the subsurface. So the deepest part of the slab is about 2,000 kilometers. And this is actually the first time this kind of model is generated. And if you look at the particular geometry of that in the, in the context of the surface topography, this is what it looks like. It's very 3D. And, it's, um, and this structure, um, of course, we said we have validated that using uh, data. First of all, we look at the upper mantle comparison. These are different cross sections. Uh, the, the predicted slab structure is the blue feature, uh, the color. And the, the yellow line here is the best fit uh, geometry of the distribution of earthquakes. Each dot is an earthquake. So this is called the Benioff zones. But anyway, um, so we are using that to approximate the slab geometry. This is a traditional way people de define that. And we are actually using a time-dependent model to predict the Benioff zone instead of directly using that into the model. So that's actually a step forward compared to the existing exercises. So 
that's the upper mantle. Now this is the lower mantle. For the lower mantle, we are looking at four different seismic tomography models. And, uh, for, and we, for each model, we are looking at different depths. And overall, you see that the different tomography models differ in details. And that's a known problem. Tomography is never perfect because it's invert. It's kind of like remote sensing. So they have differences. However, all these models actually fit more or less with our prediction. So in a way, this is um, a pretty uh, well-constrained model. And with that, actually, we, we can already generate some very uh, useful constraint on the mental uh, deep mental structure, as well as a very important property of the mantle, that is the viscosity structure of the mantle. We know mantle is a high viscosity fluid, but we really don't know how the what is the magnitude of viscosity and how it varies with depths. And this process, by generating the subduction history since like the remote past and to the today and compare with observation, we actually can play, place a very strong constraint on the viscosity variation with depths. It's actually a very novel way of, of doing this um, a classic problem. So, so furthermore, um, with this, our model suggests that the subducting oceanic plateaus, as I, as I said in the beginning, one of the three hypotheses is the main cause for the flat slab subduction. But more importantly, we found that all these flat slabs are actually all broken. They're all torn. And this is very different from the traditional view of 2D models, where it shows flat slab is just the reduction of the deep angle, right? It's, it's very 3D. So if you look closely at our model prediction, this is for the entire South America. This is a piece of the original seismic tomography. It's a high resolution, but this is basically only for that little corner here. So this is looking westward. This is looking almost like southward. So you see that like that tear here is predicted here. So it's actually very precise. Um, and this is a downward view of what the some subsurface mantle structure look like. So you see that now. Um, well, again, the, temp, the, the, the color here represents the depths. OK, this is actually. Uh, actual depths in terms of kilometers. So you, so you see that all these, flat, all these flat slab region, this part and that part and that part, they're all gaps. It's not really continuous, you know, a 3D uh, or continuous like a, a flat slab. And the, the white lines here are actually the interpolate geometry of the earthquake distribution. And that's a traditional way people define flat slabs. And the, traditionally, people only look at this white line. They say, oh, this is a flat geometry because it's, it's shallower. But they assume this is all continuous. But from our models, we actually fit this overall geometry almost perfect. However, at every kink or flat slab, there is a, there is a hole. So is that real? And this is something totally surprising to us in, a, in, a, in the first place. And then we look at the original data. So now we compare the actual model with the actual earthquake itself, not the earthquake interpolated geometry. It's the actual earthquake. So each dot here is an earthquake. So different color correspond to, to different depths. So you see that wherever we predict a slab gap, there is actually a, almost like an absence of earthquake. So when you interpolate all these earthquakes, you know, using whatever interpolation method, you get this continuous profile, right? So if you really zoom into this uh, flat slab region, what you see is that um, within our prediction, every earthquake that's observation falls within the interior of our slab. So that's true for all the depths. For this is the Peruvian flat slab, this is the central Chile flat slab. And this is almost perfect. Another very important constraint is these white bars. These are actually the dilatational stress axis inferred from the focal mechanism of the earthquakes. So in a way, it's the stress state of the slab. And traditionally, it's believed that this stress state for earthquakes should be always be down deep. So that should be always perpendicular to the trench. However, that's actually not the case. If you look at the flat slab region, they are all kind of like circular. They're going circular. And and that observation is kind of counterintuitive, but if you look at our model, it's actually very natural because wherever you form a, a gap, a hole, I mean, it's actually this is the classic engineering problem. When you are, we have like expanding hole, the stress should be parallel to the rim of the hole. And that's actually a very, oh gosh, five minutes. Okay, so, so that's just a summary of this flat slab. So it's actually broken geometry instead of that. So our next step here is we want to look at the formation of the Andes Mountain. And this is actually very interesting. Uh, implication because our model predicts a major slab gap in the uh, in the in, in the central Chilean uh, Andean part like earlier, and this actual prediction is confirmed by its tomography, and we actually have a, a new NSF pro, uh, proposal started. So the second uh, part of this is on the formation of intraplate volcanism. In this case, we are looking at Yellowstone in particular. So intraplate volcanism is volcanism that happened within the interior of a plate, not on the boundaries here and here. So usually people believe this is the mantle plume related process. 
And uh, for example, within continent, we also have that, like Yellowstone, for example. If you look at the so-called Yellowstone Volcanic Province, this is the historical record data of the Yellowstone Volcanic um, 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 uh, rocks. So if you zoom into this, you actually see a very clear age progression. Initially, you have this north-south orientation of the so-called Columbia River flood basalt, and we are not far from that. And uh, then afterwards, these volcanic eruptions migrate both eastward and, mig uh, and westward, forming a hotspot track. This is called Yellowstone hotspot. This is the Newbury. And we are right here. So we're actually in a very dangerous place, geologically speaking. This is the active volcanic field. So there are like competing hypotheses whether this whole system is formed due to a shallow origin, for example, subduction, or it's due to a deep origin like Mandel Plume. And we're actually testing that. The way we do this is data simulation. So the first part we did is a forward model. And this is a tomography image. If you look at two cross sections through that, you see that's kind of like the putative plume, so it's actually not connected to the surface. On the surface, is, there is a region that's clearly very, very hot, but it's not connected to the tomography. This is another model tomography, similar geometry. Right, so what we did here, we did something similar to South America. So we run the forward model, the green surface is the slab, so you're looking west again. And then we add a plume underneath that, and we see how the plume evolves with time. And it turns out the plume is actually very subject to the motion of the slab itself. And today, so you, you somehow predict the geometry of like these two cross sections of the mantle tomography at deeper depths, but not on the shallow depths where the mantle is very hot in observation. So overall, we are saying that a single plume model cannot explain either the, the observed seismic tomography or the age migration of these hotspot tracks. So then what's the real, the true reason? And that's what we do in the next step. So we actually use an inverse model, so-called adjoint model. So what we did here is we just get some kind of initial guess, and then we run forward in time, and we compare that with tomography, and we, then we propagate the residual backwards. So iteratively, back and forth, back and forth, we now finally got the best fit model, and that's the prediction, and that's observation. So temperature versus tomography at different depths, this is in the lower mantle part, so it's almost perfect. And from that, what we concluded, we found is that, so during this whole process, if you look at the Yellowstone Snake River Plain, a cross section, the plume, so called plume, is actually not doing much. This is similar to our forward model. However, what is causing this gigantic uh, pulse of volcanic uh, mantle is actually a hot, very hot mantle coming from the oceanic side. So, by the way, this is a subducting slab. So, this is a slab. And that's the oceanic mantle. So, it's kind of like going through uh, the edge of the slab into the western US. So, you see the eastward migration at very shallow depths. And that's very different from the plume. So, this is a 3D view of that. Model. Um, okay, so initially, 18 million years, so all these hot anomalies are underneath the ocean. So, this is, by the way, this is the trench, and this is going northward. Okay, you are looking kind of like a northwest uh, word. And that's the plume on the eastern side, the so called plume. And now, afterwards, what happened is, see, 16, uh oh, yeah. OK, so 16 or 15 million years, this is the pulse that formed the Columbia River flow episode. But this is all related to the shallow mantle on the oceanic side. There's nothing related to the plume itself. And uh, let's run this all the way to the present day. Sorry about the quality of this. It's just a projection issue. OK, now you see the eastward migration along the Snake River plain, uh, the so-called hotspot track. And it's all controlled by the shallow process. The, man, the plume itself is actually playing a very, very minor role. OK, so now we look at the time by evolution of that. So these are 80 kilometer depths in a map, how the magmatic system evolves. So 18 million years ago, you see there's not much hot anomaly. This is the temperature, actually. Uh, uh, and I'm also showing the, the volcanics, so these are dots. But it doesn't matter. Let's move. So 16 million years, this is the Columbia River flop, so the big pulse. And there's one pulse in the southern uh, basin range. And then this is 12. So we now see the bifurcating uh, movement of the hot mantle all the way to today, oops, all the way to today. So overall, our conclusion here is that the mantle plume is actually not doing much. Instead, it's the intruding hot oceanic cenosphere or the oceanic upper mantle that's causing the, 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 uh, the observed Yellowstone volcanic province. And that is actually a conclusion that's very different from the traditional view.